In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We fly to thy patronage, our Holy Mother of God. Despise not our prayers and our necessities, but deliver us from all danger, O glorious and ever-blessed Virgin. Our Lady of the Oratory, St. Philip Neri. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you followed the series of the last two Saturday Recollections, you will have heard me speak about the introduction to the devout life of St. Francis de Sales. In the first conference, I surveyed the content of parts one, two, and three. And in the second recollection, parts four and five. If you haven't heard those talks, they are recorded and you may like to have them, particularly as Lent is approaching. In the fifth part of the introduction to the devout life, St. Francis de Sales makes an assertion which I think is of immense importance in the spiritual life. He says this, we are being formed by our desires and our resolutions. We are being formed by our desires and our resolutions. Or in other words, the things that speak most clearly and perhaps most persuasively to us are our desires and our resolutions. But of course, there is an, an important link between what we desire and what we resolve to do. One might say that our resolutions probably have as their object our desires. We want to want good, but we recognize that our desires are sometimes, perhaps even often, wayward. And that even in those wayward desires, there is hidden there, quite often, something which is good in itself, but in a lesser proportion and in a circumstance other than the one in which we find ourselves. What St. Francis de Sales is talking about in that fifth part of the introduction to the devout life is what we might broadly term conversion. How we attend in an effective and continual way to the work of our sanctification. That work which we know by God's grace is going on all of the time, but we only think about it every now and then. Hopefully, more often than not. But in maybe moments of carelessness or in periods when our spiritual life is not high on our list of priorities, we can suffer the effects of neglect. And in, in neglecting the process of our sanctification, we turn aside from perhaps the most important work of stewardship that has been entrusted to us. The stewardship of our own souls, how we look after ourselves and the most important part of us, the part of us which will continue to exist even after this body has long since given up. It's our sanctification, our conversion, if you will, that is important. And after exploring all of the possibilities that the spiritual life proposes, St. Francis de Sales limits himself, as it were, to the practicalities of what needs to be evident in our life on a daily, weekly, monthly, 
and yearly basis. In that second category, those things that we should think about on a weekly basis, or by that let us understand, perhaps in a more dynamic um, equivalent translation, on a regular basis, is the sacrament of confession. Perhaps for most of us, the most obvious place of our conversion and the most obvious barometer week after week, month after month, year after year of our conversion. St. Philip's work of the oratory, which as you know began with your predecessors, the little band that he gathered round him, of mostly young men who he was for the most part rescuing from the streets, not from that they were living on the streets, but they were taken up with all that a city like Rome can offer, particularly and dangerously during the hours of the siesta after lunch and also in the evening. And in those times when they might so easily have been drawn away to entertainments or pastimes that certainly do not favor their sanctification, St. Philip proposes to them for their edification things which will support and encourage them in the spiritual life of their conversion. And principally, among those things, he proposed to them the practice of regular confession. Now, I'm presuming that nobody here needs to be persuaded that that confession is a good thing, or needs to be persuaded of the efficacy of confession. It's a fundamental principle of the spiritual life that we should confess our sins. If you want it expressed in legal terms, it's a commandment of the church that we confess our mortal sins at least once a year. But let's not be legalistic about this, because Ultimately, we make time for those things that we desire, those things that we want to do. Our priorities can be determined by examining our calendar, our diary. We tend to do the things we want to do. And we are negligent about those things which seem to be less important, at least to us in that moment. So I may forget to pray, but I don't forget to eat. I may be negligent about going to confession, but I don't miss a day when I don't look at my email 20 times, maybe. We make time for what is important to us. And the important things will always get done and things which are less important to us will characteristically be relegated and will be done less often and eventually maybe not at all. Such is human nature. And the great spiritual teachers understand this, and that's why they propose to us spiritual norms and customs that encourage us in the right path. You might say to yourself, well, I certainly go to confession once a year. Do I need to, to, to go more frequently than that? Well... If you go to the top 
of a tall building. There aren't many buildings that are that tall in this city, but um, if you go to the top of a tall building and you stand on the top of that building and you have something of a panoramic view, you can pick out the major landmarks of the city, given that you might be looking at the city of Washington, D.C. You'll be able to pick out famous landmarks that you will recognize. If you were to to take a telescope, you were you would be able to pick out not only the the places that are the principal landmarks, but you'll be able to see into those places. Perhaps see that there were people inside some of the buildings, or you'd be able to have a greater awareness of what was happening. You'd be able to see things that were far off, not just those buildings which are close to and are easily seen with the naked eye. Well, the regularity of confession is something like that. If you go to confession once a year, you'll be able to give a general account of your life and you'll pick out the major things that need to be mentioned. What you won't be able to give an account of to to the same extent, because a year is a lot of living in anybody's life, is the undercurrents of the sort of things that habitually cause us to fail. So while it's better to go to confession once a year than not at all, it's not so effective in the work of our conversion because we never really get to the nub of the issue in terms of, to use some Francis de Sales words, our desires and our resolutions if we're only able to give the most generic account of what defeats us, our sin. If, however, we keep a shorter account and we're able, for instance, to go to confession once a month, we would be far more in touch with what's going on in our life and importantly, what's going on in our soul. We can reveal in our confession things which will enable us ourselves to understand that more clearly. And it might even be that the priest to whom we confess is able to help us in identifying strategies which will more obviously move us away from the things which tend to defeat us. If we go more regularly, if we, for instance, tend to go every week or every 10 days or every two weeks, then that magnification of the scene, if you will, is even stronger. And we are far more likely from one confession to the next to have a sense that we can improve with God's help, and by systematically working on things which we know we need to change. We also find, perhaps, if we go to confession more regularly, our confessions tend to become rather more simple. We just tend to say, what has happened? That's important that our confessions are concise, complete, and contrite. Prepare well for confession, whether it's been a long time since you last went, or whether your last confession was just a week or a few days ago even. The more we prepare for confession, the more we are likely to get out of it as we open our hearts to receive God's grace and his help. There's nothing worse either for the penitent or for the confessor 
than somebody who comes to confession not really having given it any thought at all. The priest doesn't want to hear you read out an examination of conscience, waiting for each question for you to ponder whether it is applicable or not. All of that needs to be done in your time. Come to the confession ready to confess. It doesn't matter if you've only got one thing to say or a couple of things to say. Neither does it matter if you have many things to say. The only criterion for determining what should be included in your confession is whether it's sinful or not. It's the greatest opportunity we ever have after baptism to be parted from the ongoing effects of sin in our lives. Of course, when we go to confession, it isn't the magic wand waved over our lives. It's not as if the things that we've done never happened. But what is changed is the manner in which those sins continue to impact on us and negatively. The memory of a sin remains and a sin, the memory of a sin that has been confessed should motivate us to renew our sorrow for the sins of the past and our gratitude for the immensity of God's mercy which is so much bigger than the sins we commit. Ultimately, we're not just what we say in confession. It's only one relatively small part of our spiritual life. But if we can deal effectively with that part of us, then the rest of our spiritual lives have a chance to flourish. We'll feel greater motivation in the life of prayer. We'll come to the reception of Holy Communion with a heart that is lightened by sacramental absolution. We'll find it easier to be charitable with other people because so often, and this is the other half of St. Francis de Sales' admonition, we will have made resolutions about how we hope to change. It might surprise you to know that after 31 years of hearing confession, the most obvious sin that is repeated and figures in the largest numbers of confession is unforgiveness. The inability that people have to forgive those who have injured or hurt them in some way. And of course, that's a very, very natural reaction. When people hurt us, we don't feel any natural inclination to forgive them. The natural inclination is to to hurt them back, to get even, to inflict pain by way of retribution on others. But of course, that's the path to nowhere except everybody being hurt. So what we have to do is make a resolution, and often that's a resolution made in the confessional, assisted by the grace of that sacrament. If we have to resolve to do better in our relations with someone, if we have to choose to forgive them, it's an act of the will that supersedes any particular emotion or feeling in that situation. We might even say to ourselves that we don't particularly believe that person even deserves to be forgiven. That is less important. The ultimate importance is the act of will which enables us to do things we don't feel like doing. Rather like the act of will that you make in the morning when the alarm goes off and although everything in you wants to continue, if not to sleep, then to remain in bed, you do eventually manage to subject your emotions to your will and to get out of bed 
and to start the day. And then having got out of bed and the day underway, of course, our feelings, our emotions come in line with the decision that we've made. And so it is with other acts of the will in our lives. If you choose to forgive someone, you may not feel differently about that person today or even tomorrow, but eventually your feelings will come in line with the act of will that you have made. Don't wait till you feel like it. It will never happen. So we have to make acts of the will or resolutions, if you like, and there's no better place for that than confession. In fact, the church requires us to make a firm purpose of amendment by which we promise to do all within our power to avoid that sin for the future. That's a resolution. And these are the resolutions that ultimately shape and guide our lives. I started with a citation from the fifth part of the introduction to the devout life. We are being formed by our desires and our resolutions. As we move towards Lent, it's good to have this in mind and to even now to identify a spiritual program and strategy for renewal and conversion. St. Philip often said to the brothers, when shall we begin doing good? When shall we start to put all of this into practice? Well, truth to tell, we have started to put it into practice, but maybe our efforts are somewhat faltering. Maybe the vulnerabilities within us impede any real progress. That's why something like regular confession is so helpful. Keep a short tally. It won't stretch your memory, but it might help your conversion. Certainly, God gives in that sacrament the grace which we need to address the consequences of our sins. To heal the wounds that have been inflicted by our own wrongdoing or the sins of others. And to find within ourselves the courage that we need to keep turning away from sin and turning to God. For that is the turning that is implied in the etymology of the word conversion. And in our Catholic understanding, it is not just a single definitive moment, but it's a lifetime of renewing that resolution and so being formed by our resolutions in such a way that, please God, with the help of his grace, over a lifetime, our desires are more obviously aligned with the will of God. If that is our desire, if that's what we ask of God in our prayers, if that's what we seek to see happening in our spiritual life, the God who is greater than all our sinfulness, the God who, whose will it is for our sanctification will do no less than answer our prayer. Remember what St. Francis de Sales says, we are being formed by our desires and our resolutions. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.